Well, very good evening, and I hope you are all rested this afternoon. And I, I really hope you're getting a better quality sound than we had this morning. I, I must apologize for that. Again, I don't know quite why that happened. Uh, with uh, that in mind, just a reminder that uh, we are not with you next week. By God's grace, we are on holiday. But Ian will be taking, Reverend Ian Beaton will be taking the morning and evening services. On Monday, we have, uh, Tuesday, we have the Road to Recovery and we will have Eddie Murison speaking for us. And we really look forward to that because Eddie's got a big speaking ministry all over the country. And with uh, the rest of the time that we are away, we have booked uh, speakers, missionary evangelist Mark, uh, Mark uh, Randall. We have Alex Stewart from Maryborough, Reverend Alex Stewart. We've got the Reverend John Ross from Edinburgh. And we have the Reverend Peter Carr from Paisley South helping us uh, in the meantime. So we're very grateful to the Lord for his provision. And uh, I will send these addre email addresses to you, Angus, and I'll send the rest of the, the contact links to you and you can uh, link everyone up. So many thanks for your help in that. Many thanks for your help, Ian and Eric. And with that, We'll begin our public worship of God by singing to his praise in Psalm 1. Psalm 1. That man hath perfect blessedness, who walketh not astray in counsel of ungodly men, nor stands in sinner's way. We'll sing this to God's praise. That man had perfect blessedness, who walketh not astray, in counsel of ungodly men, nor stands in sinners way, nor sitteth in the scorner's chair, but blesses his delight upon God's law and meditate on his law day and night. He shall be like a tree that grows near planted by a river. Which in his season yields his fruit, and his leaf fadeth now. And all he doth shall prosper well, the wicked are not so. But like they are unto the shaft which wind drives to and fro in judgment therefore shall not stand such as ungodly are nor in the assembly of the just shall wicked men appear. For by the way of godly men unto the Lord is known, whereas the way of wicked men shall quite be overthrown. We'll pray together. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we look to you to bless us this evening, Lord. We do thank you that we are found together 
around your word, Lord, singing your praises. We thank you that you're the great and gracious and glorious God of all creation. You're the God of our salvation, and we rejoice in you this evening, Lord. We bless you for who you are and what you have done for us. We praise you, Lord. We worship you and we pray, Lord, by the help of your Holy Spirit this evening, that we would do so in spirit and in truth. We pray for the spirit of praise and adoration, that you might reveal Jesus to our hearts, Lord, by your blessed Holy Spirit. We praise you and thank you for the glorious gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, God's Son, who came to save sinners. We thank you that that news is going out to the ends of the earth this evening, to a world that is largely confused and rebelling and running away from you and shaking its fist at you. But we thank you, Lord, that in it all, you are the God who has revealed yourself as he who came to seek and to save that which was lost. And we rejoice in that truth, that the heart of the Lord is mercy. We do confess our sins this evening, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that with you there is forgiveness. And Lord, that you may be feared. The psalmist recognized that you have power to forgive sins. And we thank you, Lord, that that power is in the blood of Jesus, as we know. We thank you, Lord, that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We thank you for that wonderful salvation that you have procured for us. And this evening, Lord, we commit our worship to you. We commit our time together to you. We commit our fellowship and congregation to you. We commit our extended families to you. And we commit our communities to you. And we commit our nations to you. And we give you thanks, Lord, in all things for the way that you have provided for us and the way you have helped us right through our days, Lord. And in recent days, we have so much to be thankful for in your revealing of yourself in love, grace, and mercy, and in your gracious, gracious provision for us. We bless you and thank you. We thank you, Lord, for answered prayer. We thank you, Lord, for uh, uh, Diane's mum being home and that we have a modicum of improvement and the hope of improvement as treatment continues. We pray, Lord, that that would be the case. And we pray that you administer to the family at large at this time, Lord, revealing yourself as the God who knows, the God who loves, the God who cares, and the God who can be trusted. We do pray for all our congregation at this time, Lord. We know there are many issues facing many in the congregation, Lord. And we pray at this time that there would be your overarching peace in every heart, Lord, that there would be the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ overarching every trial, overarching every difficult situation and perplexing condition. We pray, Lord, that your word would be ministered to us all in such a way that we would find hope and comfort in it. We thank you, Lord, that you've reminded us of how great you are and how much higher your ways are than our ways and how much higher your thoughts are than our thoughts. And we thank you, Lord, that you speak to us in your word and that you speak to us in providence. And we bless you and thank you, Lord, that we can speak to you and we can listen to you. And we pray this evening, Lord, that we would hear your voice. We do pray, Lord, for our government in the management of uh, internal affairs and international affairs, Lord, and especially in the public sector at this moment, Lord, when there is so much that, that it's difficult to even project or 
or to work out or to contain. But we pray, Lord, that you would lead as you do, Lord, unerringly, and that our governments would be humble, Lord, to seek out you and to seek out your wisdom and grace in the way they lead us. And we pray, Father, for the free church and the return to public worship strategy, Lord, that it would be done in a way, Lord, that would be blessed and where we could feel encouraged and know that the hand of God is upon us in all these things. We do pray, Father, for the work of the gospel in our communities at this time. We pray that hearts would be prepared, Lord, that there would be the true turning to Christ in people's lives as they consider, Lord, their vulnerability and as they consider their ways, Lord, that they would see, Lord, that at the best we are men and women at best and that, Lord, we are frail and fragile and very mortal, but yet, Lord, we have immortal souls that we need to consider. And we pray this evening, Lord, that many in our communities would be doing that, Lord, and that your spirit would work in such a way as to bring revival, to bring hope, to bring salvation. We think, Lord, of troubled areas in the world where there is unrest and rumors of war, Lord. We pray for peace and we pray for cooperation and international diplomacy that would win the day, Lord, and that you would be glorified in it. And Lord, where we have uh, the lust for power and control, that Lord, you would show uh, the nations that they are but a drop in the bucket as they consider the greatness of our God who has blessed all nations in the frailty of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray then this evening for the sick, Lord, for the suffering, for the lonely, the depressed, the anxious, those connected with us, Lord, and those unknown to us, that you would minister to them, Lord, to bring hope and to bring peace and to bring a measure of healing. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be glorified in our time together at this time, Lord. And when we go one from the other, that we could truly acknowledge, Lord, that it was good for us to have been together with you this evening. Bless those who are not with us, Lord. Minister to their hearts, minister into their situations, and bring them comfort and hope in every way. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask it with the forgiveness of all our many sins. And for its sake, forgive us. Amen. We're going to sing our first hymn now, which is a hymn called Take Time to Be Holy. It's sung to a very familiar tune, so you may be able to join it in with us. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children, help those who are we, forgetting in nothing is blessing to see. To God's praise. Take time to be holy, speak up with thy word. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing, in blessings to see take time to be holy the world rushes on spend much time in secret with jesus alone by looking to jesus 
Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in my conduct, his likeness shall see. Be calm in thy soul, beneath his control. Thus led by spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shalt be fitted for service above. Thou soon shalt be fitted for service above. We're going to read from the Word of God in the New Testament book of Colossians and at chapter 2. We'll read from verse 1. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you are circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands by putting off of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who are dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in details about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, 
but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Amen. And may the Lord bless that reading of his own holy word to us. And welcome Malachi, I just noticed. Uh, we'll sing once again in uh, the Psalms, Scottish Psalter, and in Psalm 103, we'll sing the first five oh, verses. Oh, oh, thou my soul, bless God the Lord, and all that in me is, be stirred up his holy name to magnify and bless. You sing along, Malachi. <laughs> O thou my soul, bless God the Lord, and all that in me is, be stirred up his holy name to magnify. Blessed, O oh my soul, the Lord thy God, and not forget to be of all his gracious benefits. He had bestowed on thee, O thine iniquities to most graciously forget to thy diseases fall and faint. Doth it and be renewed? Who doth redeem thy life that thou to death may not go down? Who did with love? Before we turn to the Word of God, we'll pray briefly together. Good singing, Malika. Gracious God, thank you, Lord, for our time together. And thank you, Lord, for these words we were singing. O thou, my soul, bless God the Lord, and all that in me is, be stirred up his holy name to magnify and bless. Lord, may it be so that you would stir us up to magnify you and to bless you this evening, that you would minister your word to us, Lord, through your spirit of grace, Lord. We pray that you would open up our minds, our hearts, our understanding to receive the things of God and Christ, and that, Lord, you would be glorified in it all. And when we go one from the other, that we could truly acknowledge your blessing and how good it is to meet together and how good it was to have been together with you this evening. And in the precious name of Jesus, we pray it with the forgiveness of all our sin. Amen.
Well, you know, John Newton was a wonderful pastor who had a very troubled past. And uh, he was also blessed with writing probably the best known hymn in the world, Amazing Grace. But he also wrote much more. He wrote books. He wrote uh, pastoral, epistle, uh, pastoral letters. And he wrote many devotionals. And one of the poems he wrote was, he said, I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith and love every grace might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. T'was he who taught me thus to pray, and he, I know, has answered prayer, but it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hoped that in some favoured hour at once he'd answer my request, and by his love's constraining power Subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more with his own hand he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds and laid me low. Lord, why is this, I trembling cried? Wilt thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and fear. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to see thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayst seek thy all in me. One of my friends who has gone on to glory told me that he prayed that he would hate sin and God answered his prayer, he said, because he grew to hate the sin that was revealed in, him, in his own heart. And God really does deal with us in ways that we don't know. I want to look tonight at uh, growing saints and especially verse 7 of chapter 2. But we'll read also verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And now Paul is exhorting the Colossian believers to grow as Christians with a big emphasis on being thankful. As we receive Christ, we must, of course, walk in him and with him in faith and obedience. It's a way of life. And our way of life should witness for Jesus and speak of Jesus and point to Jesus in every aspect of our lives, including the silent witness of our lives. So I want to look at three things this evening. Growing as a Christian, grounded as a Christian, and grateful as a Christian. If I sort my notes out. Growing as a Christian, we're told, rooted and built up in him. Now, when we think of roots, we think, of course, of trees and plants, don't we? And we might think of settling down a place, set, uh, uh, putting down roots. And this speaks of growing spiritually. For a tree or a plant, it means to be rooted in a place where it can draw the minerals and all it needs to grow and to sustain health. Rooted, we'll notice it says, in him. Now, in hot tropical rainforests, it's quite common for big plants and trees to grow up pretty quickly. And in some cases, they grow up almost overnight. We remember in Jonah's case, the gourd grew up almost overnight. But these trees have soft wood 
and they are easily destroyed by insects and diseases and they don't last long. But in the rugged mountains in the north, growth is slow. Plants and trees have to endure huge winds, storms, cold, snow, ice. But they grow strong and tough because of these conditions. And they grow hard wood and they, the roots go deep. And actually in, in the giant redwood forests of California, the, the, the roots go so deep that they also cling to each other. And that is an added strength. And in Christ, the believer is rooted in Christ. But not only rooted in Christ, we are also linked together through the fact that we are all rooted in Christ. Hardships have values that we don't like. We don't like hardship, but they have a tendency to strengthen us and strengthen our faith. And here we say, it says, rooted in him and built up in him, established in the faith. We'll not you notice that the root in Christ comes before the faith. As the tree strikes its root into the earth, so our faith should strike deep into the person of Christ, the person of Christ, the work of Christ, and the doctrine telling us of the work of Christ, respecting all that he is and does for us. Firmly established as a tree whose roots are struck deep and who, which stretch far. The meaning is that his love should be as firm in our hearts as a tree is in the soil who's deep in the earth. Roots are deep in the earth and have spread out. And that's the process is rooted and built up. Growth takes time as the rooting spreads deeper and the growth flourishes. There is a beautiful hymn which we sang. It takes time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children. Help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing is blessing to see. Friends, growing spiritually takes time. <laughs> when we are first amazed by the grace of God, then we begin to grow. And this growing continues for all of our lives. <clears throat> and we need to make sure that we have quality time with the Lord in our devotions. And we need to make sure that we have that quality time together as a fellowship because we grow uh, together as a community. <clears throat> Often it is difficult when we have rushed to have time to spend that quality time with the Lord. And I think we all may know something about that. It's a story I've told before, but it was a, it certainly was an, an eye-opener and a mild rebuke from the Lord for me. I was going to work. I was working 25 miles from home. It was winter. The weather was really bad. And uh, I had other people to, I had the responsibility of taking others to work. I was up at six and uh, I had to organize things in the house and then out the door. And I remember praying to the Lord and saying, Lord, I don't seem to have enough time with you in the morning. And uh, I just seem to be always rushing. And this morning, I sprang out of bed and I found as I looked and got ready that I'd woken up an hour earlier, my uh, alarm clock had gone off an hour earlier. And the lesson was very simple. God said, you prayed for more time with me in the morning. Get up earlier. <laughs> it wasn't all that pleasing to my constitution at the time, but it made so much sense. Now, Excuse me, I think I've lost my place.
to the... So, taking time with the Lord means that we have to make a conscious effort to set aside that time. And the person that we are to be rooted in is him. You see, Christ's at the front. It comes, he comes before faith. He's at the front and he's at the center of our faith. And him in Christ, here he is the beginning and the end. The more you grow spiritually, the more prominent the Lord Jesus Christ becomes in your life. So growing as Christians, we need to be grounded as Christians established in the faith our feet must be on firm ground we must be firm in the faith not fickle we need to be grounded in christ you you'll notice like we said rooted in him if we are grounded in him we will be established in the faith we need the proper ground to grow in the person and the work of christ is what we are to be grounded in in him, in him and his word. And it's imperative that we realize the importance of being grounded in the right ground. Now, we hear many things, but friends, we know that our grounding is grace alone, Christ alone, scripture alone, faith alone, to the glory of God alone. Otherwise, there would be no firm foundation, nor true ground. Now, today, as always, we see attempts to mix the word of God with the culture and mix it with many other things that are valued rather than mixing it with faith. And we remember the writer to the Hebrews told about those who did not mix the word of God with faith. And when this happens, there is no firmness of faith, no ground that they are established in. Because the solid rock, the ground is Christ. And if they are not grounded in Christ, they do not have the convictions of Christ. And whatever wind of doctrine blows across them, they succumb to that doctrine and belief. I was very taken aback to speak to a friend of mine that I hadn't spoken to in a long time yesterday. And he told me that another friend of ours who had been a Christian for many years had decided to become a Roman Catholic. And he put the church above the word of God. The result of not being rooted in Christ is that people may be like reeds swaying in the wind. Remember, Jesus asked the crowd, what did you come to see a reed swaying in the wind? The people can, John was not swayed. He was bruised, but not swayed. The wind of this doctrine or that doctrine, people can be taken up with it if they are not rooted in Christ. And Paul says, as you have been taught, Paul is exhorting the Colossian believers to grow as Christians with. He is reminding them that it was his teaching to them. As you have been taught. And remember what Jesus taught Peter and what indeed Jesus teaches you and I. I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You are Peter, Jesus said. You are Petros. You are a small, loose stone. But on this rock, Petra, on this living bedrock, I will build my church. The church is built on the living bedrock of the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostolic doctrine, the word of God. It is not built on a sinful man. We need to pay attention to the teaching of Jesus and to the teaching of Paul, the apostolic teaching, the teaching of the word of God and the whole counsel of God 
if we are to grow spiritually. Good Bible teaching is absolutely essential to the growth of the faith of the saints. That is the Christians, because saints aren't an elite class of believer. The truth is that the Bible teaches us that every soul that has trusted Jesus Christ for their salvation is indeed a saint. And teaching is essential because it gives Christians power to live the Christian life. And often there is a scaling down of the emphasis on the teaching of the Word of God with a corresponding emphasis on other things at church. And that these other things may increase a lot of things, but it does not increase the faith of the people. How do we know? Because we know. Because we are assured that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Remember, we looked the other night, how did Jesus deal with the doubts that John the Baptist had? Jesus dealt with his doubts by sending him the word of God. Friends, when we are struggling, we go to Jesus and we look to him to speak to us because he promises that his sheep will hear his voice and they will follow him. Jesus said, my sheep know me and they follow me. Teaching is seen as unimportant often and a greater emphasis is put on other things. And that sadly, this, as we have seen, leads to the word of God being marginalized and cultural norms and values of the world being adopted by professing Christians. And I was recently speaking to on a, an apologetics Facebook group yesterday, in fact, and uh, this morning, and uh, I was scolded for, uh, for uh, rebuking critical thinking that was not ru ru uh, rooted in the word of God. And I had to say, well, you know, without faith, it is impossible to please God. People want to dissect the word of God without reference to God. Cultural norms and values are adopted. And it means largely that those who do that go away from God and go away from Christ and are not operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Because the, it is the Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth and points us to Jesus. And friends, we know that the Holy Spirit in a person will not contradict the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. I have heard things like times are changing, things move on. Of course they do. But the word of God endures forever. The Lord said, I am the Lord, I change not. We need to be rooted in and established in him for our faith to be a biblical faith. Because remember what the spirit of God through the prophet Isaiah said to, uh, to say to us in Isaiah 1 verse 22. He spoke to the people of the day and it still speaks to the those who have gone away from Christ, and it serves as a warning for us. Your silver has become dross. Your best wine is mixed with water. Friends, the word of God is being watered down. The gospel is being watered down. The new wine of the gospel is being diluted with the water of legalism and works. Sin is ignored. With this watering down, often everybody gets saved. Lifestyle and repentance is ignored. However, we need to remind ourselves of, what, of the teaching of Scripture. Grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, Scripture alone, 
to the glory of God alone. It is grace that saves us, grace that changes us, grace that refines the silver to make us like Christ. Without God's grace, his word of grace, or his spirit of grace, there would only be dross, but the spirit and the word, they separate that dross. There is no true faith without true repentance, and there is no true repentance without true faith. True faith in the finished work of Christ, his death and resurrection, will lead to a lifestyle that follows Christ and turns away from sin. Lack of teaching was a sign of God's judgment, but failure to pay attention to the teaching of the Word of God will stunt spiritual growth. And what happens then is that it would tend to make us ungrateful. If we see a lack of gratitude in our lives today, then clearly we are not paying all that much attention to the teaching of God's word. How often have I been ungrateful? Sadly, far too often. How often have you been ungrateful? Something for you to consider. Lack of gratitude is very sinful. Things we take for granted, others dream of. You know, I did a little talk for the Camp C Church's Reflections on Friday, and I spoke about faith. We switch on the light believing that it will brighten the room. We, we turn on the tap believing it will give us water. We believe these things, but wouldn't it be more true to say we take these things for granted? A power outage today would surprise us, and it did. We take these things for granted, and other people dream of them. Spending time in Africa and having to carry water around with me everywhere reminded me of how blessed we are and how true it is that we take so much for granted and with not enough thanks. Now, we should be more and more grateful. We should be grateful Christians, abounding in thanksgiving, we're told. The foundation of the text is here, thanksgiving. Two th things are said, action of thanksgiving and the abundance of thanksgiving. One of the important things that should characterize you and I as believers is that we have a thankful, grateful spirit. Now, the world as a rule does not thank God, but strangely enough, there are times when the world does thank God. Christians thank God, and there are times when actually Christians don't thank God. And in contrast, it should be the way of life of Christians, God's people, to give thanks in all things. Now, I'm not saying that we should give thanks for the bad things that happen in our lives. And I don't think God wants us to do that. What God wants us to do is to give thanks for the blessings we have and the strength he gives us and the guidance he gives us in these bad times. And as we come through the other side of them, we can give thanks for what God has taught us. Now, when a person is converted, uh, she begins to thank God for her food at mealtimes. That's one main change. We begin to realize that all our blessings are for God. There are many changes in our lives when we are saved. And one big change is the desire to give thanks to God. I saw a meme on Facebook, probably many of you have seen it. The other day it said, I thank God for two gifts I opened this morning. My eyes. And how true that is. That Opening our eyes every morning is a wonderful gift from God. And now that's the action. We are to continually give thanks. And it's, it's an abundant thanksgiving. <clears throat> Abound, <coughs> excuse me. Abounding in thanksgiving. If we are honest, we may find that many of us are spasmodic in thanksgiving. But we should be abounding, the scripture says. We have so much to be thankful for, and our faith 
should make us abounding in thanksgiving. Of course, no blessing compares to the blessing of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation. Just knowing Christ and being a child of God. What can compare to that? When we consider him, we consider Jesus, who he is, and what he has done for us. And then we can put it in, in the, the terms of the Bible. The one, we are rooted in Christ, the one who endured such opposition from sinful men, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross. We should never stop thanking the Lord for his love and grace for the salvation he has procured for us and given us. And we should never stop thanking the Father for giving us his Son. Or we should never thank, stop thanking the Holy Spirit for making him known to us and revealing him to us and working in us. We should abound in thanksgiving for salvation. But to add to our salvation, it's all the other blessings that God gives us included in our salvation of life. And we will be abounding in thanksgiving. The psalmist realized the gracious benefits the Lord had bestowed on him. And he stirred up his soul to praise God and to not be forgetful of these benefits. We need to remind ourselves of the great blessings we have in Jesus. Why do we remind ourselves? Because we would forget. Now, we take the Lord's Supper. We meet at the Lord's table to remember the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, sadly, it's a privilege and an honor and a blessing that has been uh, not ours lately because of the COVID situation. But we, the Lord says, do this in remembrance of me. Why? Well, we're proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. And also, it is in our nature to forget. The root of our faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. Him crucified, his death and resurrection. We do so in remembrance of the Lord in his love and grace, laying his life down, shedding his precious blood for us. Peter said, I put you in remembrance of these things, although you already know them. We must remind ourselves and each other of the things of God that we may be ever thankful and grateful. I always intend to remind you of these qualities, even though you already know them. It's important to keep reminding ourselves of who Jesus is, who we are in Christ, and how we are to live our lives as children who are born again, redeemed, forgiven, and walking in the grace of God. So may the Lord bless his word to us, we should be uh, growing Christians. We should be uh, grounded Christians. And we should be grateful Christians. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your precious word. And we pray today, Lord, that you would help us to always be abounding in thanksgiving, as we have been taught, Lord. And as we look to him, who gave us so much, who gave himself for us, that it would truly be our heart, like the Apostle Paul, to say, the life I now live, I live for Christ, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We bless you and thank you, Lord. And we pray that you would build us up, continue to build us up and continue to root us more and more firmly in yourself, Lord, in your word, and continue to lead us through your word and spirit. In Jesus' precious name, Lord, forgive us. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn now, which is a reminder of where our hope is found, and that is, of course, in Christ alone. 
was full of grace and truth. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, it's firm, firm to the fiercest droughts and storms. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving sees, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. I stand in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in hell, this babe, this guilt of oh love, and righteousness, scorn by the ones he came to save. Tell on my cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Death of Christ, I live there in the ground. His body lay, light of the world by darkness lay. Then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power I have, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. power of Christ I stand. Now we do pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
the love of God our Father and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit would rest upon you and remain upon you and all whom you love now and forevermore. Amen.